Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named Stranger Things Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Previously on Season 1 in the town of Hawkins, 1983, a boy named Will was dragged into the upside-down world by a monster. The kids' friends began a rescue mission. Along the way, they encountered Eleven, a girl with superpowers who had escaped from a lab. Gradually, they uncovered a government conspiracy that used humans as experimental subjects. In the final battle, the head of the lab was instantly killed by the monster. However, to protect her friends, Eleven also turned into ashes with the monster. A year later, on a deserted street at night, a dilapidated van was parked. A few people wearing terrifying masks ran out of a building and entered the van, preparing to flee. Suddenly, the wail of a police siren echoed from behind. A patrol car was in pursuit. Just as they were about to be cornered, a mysterious girl closed her eyes. As her palms clenched into fists, the tunnel above dramatically collapsed. The driver instinctively hit the brakes. When he regained his senses, there was no sign of any collapse. What he had seen was all an illusion. The camera then focused on the girl, blood trickling from her nose and the number 008 tattooed on her wrist, indicating that she was also a superhuman like Eleven. The scene then shifts back to the town of Hawkins. Since Will's recovery, the kids' team has finally reunited and they've resumed their group games. Dustin was very keen on setting arcade records and usually dominated the leaderboard. Unexpectedly, he was overtaken by someone named Mad Max. Curiosity piqued, he asked the arcade owner about this person, who said they'd only reveal details if Mike's sister Nancy agreed to go on a date with them. Mike, of course, refused to betray his sister and argued with the arcade owner. At this moment, Will was drawn by a noise outside. Just as he was about to join his friends to see what was happening, he realized he was alone. The arcade was suddenly covered with flying debris and strange tendrils, giving it an upside-down world appearance. Clouds swirled with flashes of lightning and thunder. But before Will could make out what was inside, he heard Mike calling. The strange scene suddenly disappeared as if he had just hallucinated it all. The next day, Sheriff Hopper went to the police station for work. A gentleman had been waiting at the entrance for quite some time. He was a former reporter who had resigned to study extraterrestrials. Recently, he'd received a commission to investigate the death of Nancy's friend in this small town. He claimed that there were Soviet spies active in the town. Their secret weapon was a superpowered girl of Russian descent, the little girl Eleven. So the reporter tried to get Hopper's attention, but Hopper, well aware of the situation, didn't want to deal with him and brushed him off. He then received a call about a complaint from a farmer that all his pumpkins had rotted in the field. Hopper hurriedly left. Upon arriving at the farm, Hopper found that the situation was not simple. The pumpkins had been perfectly fine the day before, but overnight, they had all rotted and were covered in flies. Since Halloween was approaching, the farmer suspected that a competitor had sabotaged his crop to steal business. Hopper couldn't determine the cause of the rot. At this point, there was a noise in the cornfield. Thinking it was a spy from the competing business, he followed the sound, only to stumble upon a scarecrow. Elsewhere, Nancy was chatting in the car with her boyfriend, Steve. They had missed a dinner party last week, so Nancy wanted to make it this time no matter what. Steve was a bit upset. He had wanted Nancy to help him study, but he still supported going to the dinner. Just then, a sports car drifted into the parking lot. A handsome guy and a little girl got out. The guy headed towards the high school, and the girl with her skateboard entered the elementary school. Will also arrived at school. As he was looking in his locker, he saw a cutout newspaper clipping with the words Zombie Boy written on it. It was clearly a prank. He had been bullied by the school bully before and chose to endure it in silence as usual. That day, the teacher introduced a new student named Max, who was the girl from the sports car. Could she be the mad Max they knew from the game? The four boys thought it was impossible. They believed that girls didn't play video games, and it was too much of a coincidence that a person with the same name transferred to their school the day after the record was broken. But they secretly followed her after class, even checking the scrap paper she threw in the trash. The note tells them to stop spying on her. So Max had already noticed and considered the four boys as creeps, but they wouldn't give up easily. After school, they went to the arcade to stake out and indeed saw Max playing games. They were amazed by her gaming skills. Mad Max lived up to her name. At this point, Will's mother, Joyce, came to pick him up and took him to the energy lab. The person in charge here had changed. It was now Dr. Sam. Since being rescued from the Upside Down, Will still saw scenes from that world occasionally. 
Hopper thought he was sick, but it was not possible to take him to a regular hospital. They had no choice but to strike a deal with Sam. A team of experts would conduct regular checkups and record Will's physical data, listen to his hallucinations, and analyze the root cause of his illness. The diagnosis could only be explained as PTSD, a condition that could change a person's personality, making them irritable and aggressive. Joyce thought this was nonsense. Her son's condition was getting worse. Hopper advised her that Dr. Sam was an educated man after all, and PTSD was indeed a real condition. Apart from his recommendations, there really was no better treatment method. After bidding goodbye to Joyce and the others, Sam went to the incident area. The protection here was stricter than before, and the entrance to the Upside Down had been isolated. The flesh-like tendrils from the previous entrance had started to overgrow and occupy the ground. Spores had invaded the lab, and people had to be sent regularly to burn them off with torches. Nancy and Steve arrived at the dinner venue to meet the parents of her dead friend. This couple only had one daughter, who was their pampered treasure. Therefore, they didn't accept the police's closure of the case, and they sold their house to raise money to hire the reporter to investigate. According to the reporter's existing evidence, the couple felt that the truth was about to be revealed. Nancy felt guilty and excused herself to wipe away tears in the bathroom. She believed her friend's death was related to her, but because she'd signed a confidentiality agreement, she couldn't tell the truth. She could only often accompany her friend's parents, not realizing that they were still working so hard to find the truth of their daughter's death. Also remembering the departed was Mike. Every day he would speak into the radio at a fixed time and place, hoping to get a response from the vanished Eleven. Today was the 352nd day. He had not held out much hope, but suddenly he heard Eleven's call. When he tried to contact her again, it was only an excited Dustin, telling him about new developments in tracking Max. On the other side, Will was holed up in his room sketching pictures of the zombie boy. He resented how people around him treated him, always walking on eggshells as if he was a real problem, a monster. His older brother Jonathan tried to console him, making Will feel reassured. At that moment, a burly man walked in. It was Joyce's new boyfriend, Bob. Bob was an honest man with programming skills who ran a digital imaging store in the town. He often took Joyce and the two boys to the movies. Bob was cheerful and caring, which made him likable to Will. One night, Will got up to go to the bathroom. Outside, there was thunder and lightning, and the wind was howling. The front door of the house opened by itself, and there were flying spores and flesh vines everywhere. In the clouds, a creature with tentacles faintly appeared. However, there were no such strange phenomena in other parts of the town. In the middle of the night, Hopper drove into the woods and arrived at a wooden house. After knocking on the door, he heard the sound of a bolt being drawn, but no one opened the door. The television and lights were on, and food for two was on the table, along with a half-eaten waffle. Hopper was shocked to see a girl coming out. It was Eleven, who had disappeared for a year. It turned out that when Eleven killed the monster, she didn't turn into ashes with it, but fell into the Upside Down. When she woke up, she was in a school in that world, surrounded by murky air and wildly growing flesh vines. Overwhelmed by weakness and fear, she could only yell Mike's name, but there was no response. Suddenly, she heard voices from the corridor. Following the sound, she saw a red light shining on the wall at its end, a sticky film separating the two worlds. It was actually the passage torn open by the monster in the last season, similar to the tree hole Nancy discovered in the forest. It would return to normal after a certain period of time. Eleven used her telekinetic powers to expand the passage, which allowed her to return to reality from the upside down. But the school was already empty, and the scene had been cleaned up, leaving only bloodstains on the ground. Eleven immediately went to find Mike. However, Mike's house was swarming with police cars, and people from the CIA were questioning the family, claiming that Eleven was a dangerous individual. Standing outside the window with tear-filled eyes, Eleven felt wronged. She had helped humans kill the monster, but still didn't receive any recognition. Mike seemed to see Eleven too, but his actions drew the attention of the CIA agents, who immediately sent people to search outside. Eleven could only hide under a tree, huddled up and crying. During that time, she had nowhere to go. She usually lived off hunting in the forest. When winter came, she shivered with cold. One day, she happened to run into a hunter and simply took the man's coat. Like this, she lived in the forest for a few more days. On Christmas Day, she found a wooden box covered with snow. 
Inside, there were candies and waffles. Not caring who they belonged to, she took them, and this was how she ended up meeting Hopper. Soon, it was Halloween. Eleven asked Hopper if she could go out and play, thinking that a simple disguise would prevent the bad people from recognizing her. But Hopper rejected her request, giving the absurd reason that stepping out of this wooden house for any reason was too risky, and only a fool would do that. Eleven didn't want to be a fool, so she accepted Hopper's reasoning. But she was still upset and refused to eat. Hopper, feeling helpless, promised to come home early that night. He would not only buy candies for Eleven, but also stay at home and watch Daniel C.C. horror movies with her to fatten her up. Only then did Eleven crack a smile because she also liked Daniel C.C. On the other side, Joyce saw the pictures of the tentacle monster that Will had drawn. She thought he was having visions from the upside down again. Upon inquiry, she was told they were sketches for a story. Not wanting to upset Will, she didn't pursue the matter so as not to spoil the holiday mood. The kids' team donned Ghostbusters costumes and posed for photos taken by their parents. Only Mike was resistant to the camera. They then went to school together, even arguing over character selection. But this didn't break their friendship. The current situation made them even more embarrassed. All the students getting off the school bus hadn't worn costumes. They thought there would be a grand celebration, but instead became the laughing stock. But Dustin and Lucas were quickly distracted by Max. Both boys found her intriguing and thought she might like the Ghostbusters outfits. While she was at her locker, they prepared to strike up a conversation, yet they were still hesitant. By the time they decided to approach, Max had already left. They could only wait until after school to find her and invite her to join their team for trick-or-treating, even mentioning the meeting place, but Max simply turned away. On her way out, she got into a car with the handsome guy, Billy, who was her stepfather's son and a full-blown ruffian. He was strict with Max, often spoke ill of others, and didn't care about anyone's life. On the road, they encountered Mike and his friends leaving school. Seeing that Max was interested in them, they sped up, trying to knock them over. In her panic, Max took control of the steering wheel. Thankfully, it was a close call. Mike and his friends fell by the side of the road, narrowly escaping. Meanwhile, Joyce contacted Hopper and compared the pictures of the tentacle monster to the view from their front door. She was certain that Will's drawings might not be hallucinations he was seeing, but real events. This sparked the idea of taking him to the city to see a doctor. Hopper tried to comfort her, explaining it with the term flashback and suggesting it was merely a psychological trauma that would heal with time. He cautioned her that the city doctors, eager to make money, could give all sorts of excuses. They might not even be as competent as the experts in the lab. After this, Joyce gave up the idea of switching hospitals. However, the lab was withholding information. In their investigation of the Upside Down, they had placed satellite equipment inside. Unfortunately, it had recently been corroded by rain, causing a disconnection. The timing coincided perfectly with when Will encountered the storm cloud at the arcade. Dr. Sam was deeply concerned, but he couldn't figure out why. When Hopper returned to the police station, he found a truckload of rotten pumpkins at the entrance, swarming with flies. Another farmer had filed a complaint, accusing rivals of poisoning crops. The victims weren't limited to one farm. Not only pumpkins, but all crops had died. Hopper dismissed these as rumors, collecting the names of all the farmers for a local investigation. To his surprise, the claims were true. Besides crops, nearby trees had also died, all covered in a sticky liquid. Hopper suspected it was some sort of poison. He and his colleague marked the affected area with flags. Meanwhile, Nancy was still grappling with feelings of guilt over her friend's death. Seeing a curly-haired girl in the library would space her out, reminding her of her friend's last moments. When Steve found her, she confessed that she couldn't pretend everything was fine and couldn't ignore the fact that her friend's family was ruined. Steve tried to persuade her to remain rational, as revealing the truth would violate their agreement with the CIA. Not only would they go to jail, but their families could also be implicated. At the same time, Bob gave Jonathan a video camera, asking him to accompany Will for the holiday. Will didn't want to stick to his brother, fearing people would think he was sick. Jonathan understood his thoughts, so he let Will go out with the camera alone. Actually, Jonathan had something on his mind. There was a high school party that night, and he wanted to get a taste of the atmosphere. Plus, Nancy was there. Given the day's disagreement with Steve, Nancy let loose and drank a lot that night. Under the influence, she confessed to Steve that because she felt guilty about her friend, she was only pretending to love him. She felt their relationship was paid for with her friend's life, but Steve was indifferent to her friend's death, making Nancy feel ridiculous. Steve angrily stormed out, leaving Nancy feeling ludicrous about their relationship. Jonathan saw everything and quietly escorted Nancy home. 
At the same time, the kids' team began their trick-or-treating journey. Midway, a figure wearing a human skin mask suddenly rushed out, brandishing a knife at them. The group jumped in fright, but then the figure removed its mask, revealing it was Max. Despite the prank, Dustin and Lucas were quite pleased that Max had joined them and followed her happily. Only Mike felt weary, considering Max an outsider who shouldn't be part of their group. Meanwhile, Will was quietly filming everything from behind. When they reached a crossroads, Will was bullied by some high school students and fell to the ground in fright. Suddenly, his surroundings transformed into the upside down. There was no one around, and his calls for Mike went unanswered. Instead, strange noises echoed around him, and the monster appeared in the distance to flex its GPS tentacles. Will quickly ran into a hallway to hide. Just as the monster caught up with him, Mike woke him up and escorted him home. The two of them hid in the basement and whispered to each other. Will confided in Mike about his experiences, asking him to keep it a secret so others wouldn't call him a monster. On the other side, Hopper worked late into the night. Suddenly, he heard strange noises coming from the fields. Just as he was about to investigate, the farmer's child pointed a toy gun at him and wished him a happy Halloween. He quickly remembered his promise with Eleven and rushed back to his car, buying the candy from the child on his way out. Eleven was quietly watching TV at home when she received a Morse code message from Hopper saying he would be late. Her previously excited expression immediately vanished. When she heard a knock at the door, she didn't want to let Hopper in until she heard his apology and knew that he brought candy. However, she stayed hidden in the room, tuned the TV to a static channel, covered her eyes with a cloth, and gradually entered the void. She heard Mike mumbling to himself over the radio, marking day 353 since their separation. Mike had a terrible Halloween night and fantasized about getting a response from Eleven to keep his sanity. Eleven called out his name, using her superpower to get his attention, but Mike thought he was hallucinating, turned off the radio, and left the basement in despair. Eleven sat in the room, crying with a nosebleed. At this moment, Dustin just got home and heard something in the trash can by the door. He cautiously walked over and lifted the lid, only to find a creature similar to a tadpole, which should be the slug that Will vomited out in the past and survived in the sewer. Not knowing the background, Dustin carefully kept it in a fish tank, sharing his favorite nougat candy and noting its aversion to heat. However, in the middle of the night, the slug started making uncomfortable screams in the fish tank. The story takes us back to the winter of a year ago. Hopper discovered that the wooden box has been opened, and despite the snowstorm, he put food inside. Eleven observed from a distance and followed when he moved away. Hopper then took her to the cabin, originally his grandfather's dwelling that had since become his storage. Although dilapidated, it was livable. The destitute Eleven thus found a refuge from the elements. To avoid detection by the lab, Hopper taught her Morse code and set up alarms in the forest. If anyone triggered the mechanism, the alarm would blare, giving Eleven time to escape. However, she had to follow three rules. Keep the curtains drawn, only open the door to the knock encoded in Morse, and never go out alone. But Eleven didn't comply. The next morning, Hopper apologized to Eleven for breaking his word and to cheer her up. He made a special waffle-filled breakfast. As a father who had lost his daughter years ago, he now cared for Eleven as his own. He comforted her through the emotional torment of being separated from Mike, assuring her that they shouldn't meet now as it's too dangerous, but she would see Mike soon, not only in the void but in real life as well. Eleven gave him a contemptuous look and repeated her famous line, Friends don't lie. Hopper avoided her gaze, realizing his lies were ineffective, quickly dressed and tried to leave. However, an emotional Eleven flung the breakfast at him and retreated into her room. Once Hopper left for work, she broke the third rule, put on a coat, opened the door, and walked out. She left the forest and saw a mother pushing her child on a swing. She remembered asking Hopper if she had a mother, and his reply that she had passed away. Filled with sadness and jealousy, she asked for directions to the school and used her powers to make the swing whirl. Meanwhile, Bob stayed the night at Joyce's house, their relationship progressing rapidly. In the morning, Joyce was running late for work and asked Jonathan to take Will to school, but Bob volunteered to earn the boy's favor. Will liked this cheerful man and agreed. That night, Bob noticed Will was down, so he told Will the story of a clown who scared him at the amusement park as a child. Eventually, he faced his fear and yelled at him to go away, freeing himself from the nightmare. But Bob's fear was not on the same level as what Will faced. Earlier, the lab had forged a corpse, leading the town to believe that Will was dead and even held a funeral for him. When Will returned from the Upside Down, Hopper couldn't tell the truth and explained that a mistake was made at the morgue due to the extreme decomposition of the body. 
Although the explanation was plausible, Will was teased as a zombie who crawled out of his grave. Dustin woke up early in the morning to go to the library to learn about the slug species. After class, he invited everyone to the audio-visual room to show them his new pet. However, the slug's sticky body was too much for most people to handle. Only Mike dared to hold it in his hand and ask what species it was. Dustin checked the materials and couldn't find a description that matched the slug. Reptiles are usually cold-blooded creatures that love warmth and sunlight, but the slug was afraid of heat. Hence, Dustin thought the slug was a new species. Suddenly, the slug was in severe pain, as if something was wriggling inside its body. Will suddenly remembered the worm he vomited, which was also a squishy reptile. The eerie noise he heard on the street the previous night was very similar to the slugs. He thought it could be a species from the upside down. Before he could explain the situation, the bell rang for class. At the same time, Bob invited Joyce to lunch, claiming that he found Will being bullied while reviewing the surveillance footage. Joyce rushed home and played the tape under Bob's remote guidance. She wanted to identify the bullies to defend her son, but discovered they all wore masks. Will was screaming Mike's name in fear in the video, and there was a giant shadow of a snowflake in front of him. When she quickly sketched it out, she found the shadow similar to the tentacle monster drawn by Will. Just as school finished, Will shared his worm theory with Mike. At this point, Dustin was about to show the slug to the teacher. Before he could open the box, Mike and Will rushed in, grabbed the box, and rushed into the audio-visual room, initiating a secret organization meeting. Newbie Max, due to insufficient trust, was shut out. Dustin was still engrossed in the thrill of discovering a new species, a monumental achievement in science that could make him both rich and famous. Will had no evidence to prove the slug came from the upside down, let alone that it was harmful. Consequently, Dustin firmly disagreed with handing the slug over to Hopper. Suddenly, the slug was in extreme pain again and crawled out of the box, swiftly growing two hind legs. Mike didn't hesitate and tried to hit it, but the slug jumped down and ran towards the door where Max was trying to pry it open. The moment the door opened, the slug took the opportunity to escape. Despite its small size, it was surprisingly fast and disappeared in an instant. The kids had to search the entire school for it. Coincidentally, Eleven also arrived at the school and saw Mike's car at the entrance. She avoided the crowd and went inside to look for him. Mike went to the gym but unexpectedly bumped into Max, who was also looking for the slug. She asked Mike why he didn't trust her. She thought she needed to show off her skills to join the group, so she demonstrated her skateboarding skills, spinning around Mike until he was almost dizzy. Mike no longer excluded Max and even laughed and joked with her. Although their interaction didn't carry romantic feelings, the scene was witnessed by Eleven, who couldn't understand it for a while. In a fit of impulse, she used her telekinetic powers to make Max trip, and then she sadly walked away. At this time, Hopper was marking the affected areas on the town map. Unexpectedly, he made an unusual discovery. The disaster-stricken regions were expanding, with the energy lab at the center. He rushed to the lab to confront Dr. Sam for causing the toxic substances. Sam explained that his research on the Upside Down is under control. The last incineration was two days ago, so it could not possibly affect the town's ecology. Hopper couldn't discern the truth from Sam's words, so he insisted Sam send people to conduct tests. Sam had no choice but to take soil samples and then propose a solution. In the meantime, the police needed to quarantine the affected areas. Hopper was in a bind, but had no other option. He received a call from a colleague claiming a mother and son had reported an incident. From the details, Hopper realized that the reporter's story about a Russian girl might not have been made up. Understanding that Eleven must have caused trouble, he rushed over in his car. Meanwhile, Nancy found Steve playing basketball and was upset with him for not studying with her in the morning. She had forgotten what she said when drunk the previous night. Steve, still angry, brought up what happened the night before. Nancy quickly denied it all, blaming it on the alcohol. Steve gave her a chance. If she expressed her feelings now, they could make amends. But Nancy hesitated. She was filled with guilt, which was why she'd kept up the relationship with Steve. She turned to Jonathan, asked about the details of the party, and revealed her hidden thoughts. Jonathan advised her that time couldn't be turned back and she shouldn't indulge in the past. But Nancy was more angry than regretful, saying that the culprit shouldn't get away with it. Seeing someone using a tape recorder nearby, she came up with a plan. They skipped school and went home, calling her friend's mother with their new phone, and arranging to meet at the park the next morning to reveal the truth about her friend's death. However, this call was intercepted by the lab. On the other hand, Joyce realized that the illusions her younger son was seeing were actually happening. 
she hurriedly drove to the school to pick him up. Meanwhile, Will was still searching for the slug. He finally spotted it in a bathroom and contacted his team via radio. But the slug showed clear hostility towards Will, growling at him and causing Will to drop the radio and run outside. The surroundings once again transformed into the Upside Down, and the tentacle monster appeared in the hallway. Will had no choice but to run towards the playground. Dustin quickly grabbed the slug and hid it under his hat. When the others arrived, he lied, saying he hadn't found the slug. But Mike was more concerned about Will. Will fled with the clown's story suddenly popping into his mind. So he turned around, faced the tentacle monster and shouted, Go away! over and over again. But the tentacle monster didn't back down. Instead, it conjured up a hurricane that surrounded Will, and a black fog rushed into his body, revealing its true form as a mind flayer. When Joyce arrived at the school, she saw her son standing motionless on the playground, as if controlled by something. In the Upside Down, Will was terrified. When he managed to escape from the reverse world, the Mind Flayer had already entered his body. Will didn't want to be seen as a monster. Although he went home with his mother, he pretended to have lost his memory and didn't want to reveal the truth. His mother took out a drawing based on a video description. The monster on it was identical to the tentacle monster drawn by Will. He then admitted what had happened to him, but he didn't know the Mind Flayer's goal. He just knew that he'd been caught and the monster had thoroughly infiltrated him. Joyce wanted to protect her son and deal with the monster, but she didn't know how, so she had to rely on Hopper. At this moment, Hopper was in the cabin in the woods, furious. As soon as he saw Eleven returning from outside, he scolded her, failing to notice the unease in her demeanor. Not only did he ground her, he took away all her waffles and even left her without a TV for a week. Still immersed in her own despair, Eleven could not hold back her temper and used her telekinesis to stop him. Initially, Hopper only wanted to give a mild punishment, but it escalated to two weeks and then a month. Despite this, Eleven remained defiant. Hopper had no choice but to pull the plug for TV connections. This left Eleven in a panic. She usually used the TV's wireless channels to contact Mike. In the face of Hopper's domineering actions, Eleven compared him to the evil doctor. After using her powers against him, she closed the door with force, hiding in a room and crying helplessly. Her emotions were on the verge of collapse. She finally let loose a long cry of suppressed grief, and all the glass in the cabin shattered. Hopper was left standing in shock, but worried about Eleven, he ended up sleeping in the drafty living room that night. The next day, he boarded up every window, guessing that Eleven had woken up. From behind a door, he made a concession, stating that if Eleven cleaned up the house, he would come back and fix the TV in the evening. Meanwhile, Joyce called Hopper to discuss Will's situation. Unfortunately, Hopper hadn't gone to work yet, and she could only leave a message with the officer on duty. Will, who had just woken up, looked listless. His mother took his temperature and found it to be lower than normal, but Will didn't feel cold and didn't want to go to the hospital. His mother could only suggest a hot bath. However, after filling the tub with warm water, Will stood by the bathtub but didn't dare to get in. His body was trembling and he was sweating cold sweat. By the time he came out, the warm water in the bathtub had been drained. Joyce thought the water was too hot, but Will replied that he preferred it colder. When Hopper received the message from his subordinate, he drove to Will's house. By this time, it was winter. The doors and windows of the house were wide open, and there was no fireplace. Hopper was shivering from the cold, while Will sat by the bed, comfortable in the cold wind. After hearing the whole story, Hopper found it strange that Will knew the monster liked the cold. Will said he wasn't sure, but it seemed as if the monster's memories were buried deep in his mind. Without thinking, he could feel what the monster was feeling, and those memories surfaced simultaneously, spreading and growing like a devouring force. Will couldn't articulate it clearly and was in such distress that tears streamed down his face. Joyce had an idea and asked Will to draw what he was thinking. Thus, Will completed the drawing within a day. Joyce recognized the features of each picture. Once she and Hopper pieced them together, they ended up with a maze-like gibberish drawing containing winding blue paths everywhere, which upon closer inspection resembled spreading tree roots. Remembering what Will had said about the devouring memory, Hopper had an epiphany, realizing that these paths could possibly be the flesh vines of the Upside Down. On the other side, Dustin had secretly brought the slug back home, keeping it in the fish tank in his room. He fed it some nougat and covered the tank with a sheet to block out the light before heading to school. Mike and the other two kids had already arrived and were busy looking for the slug in the trash. 
Seeing Will absent from school and unable to reach him at home, Mike grew worried for his friend. Therefore, he called for a group meeting with Dustin and Lucas in the school's AV room. He revealed that Will frequently saw the tentacle monster. According to their understanding, Will possessed a kind of supervision that allowed him to see scenes from the upside down. But the two worlds exist on different planes, so the tentacle monster shouldn't be able to harm Will. The current situation seemed to defy logic. So Mike decided to investigate further, splitting into two teams. He would visit Will's house after school while Lucas and Dustin stayed at school to look for the slug, hoping to find clues. Lucas planned to invite Max, but they had excluded her from the previous two meetings. She got upset and left. Lucas caught up to try and explain, but he didn't want Max to get in trouble, nor did he want to betray his friends, so he gave up on the invitation. But their argument was seen by Billy. Although Billy didn't like his stepmother and Max, he was tasked with looking after his stepsister. He could only warn Max not to make friends with them and to stay away from Lucas. At this time, Nancy and Jonathan had skipped class to go to the park, planning to reveal all the truth to her dead friend's parents. But when the agreed time passed, the couple didn't show up. Instead, a man reading a newspaper nearby was muttering to himself from time to time. Nancy cautiously looked around at the other people and realized that they were being watched. She quickly walked towards their car with Jonathan. However, the car had been tampered with and couldn't be started. People started surrounding them from all sides, and someone came over and asked them to get out of the car. Left with no choice, they followed the arrangement and ended up being taken to the lab. Dr. Sam personally received them. He kindly took them on a tour, stating that those who had made mistakes before were dead. Now he was sent here to clean up the mess. Thus, Sam showed them the portal. He claimed that he was unable to eliminate this mistake, but would do his best to prevent it from spreading. If more people were to know about the Upside Down, it might be used by those with ulterior motives. By then, the situation would be out of control and more people would get hurt. After saying so much, Sam hoped that Nancy and Jonathan would keep the secret. He then let them go and even returned the car keys. However, Nancy didn't believe Sam. Once the car was far from the lab, she took out the tape recorder from her bag. When she pressed the play button, Sam's voice came out. It turned out that Nancy not only wanted to tell the couple the truth of her friend's death, but also wanted to make everything public, forcing the lab to pay for her friend's death. On the other side, Eleven was at home, tinkering with the television, but she had no idea how to fix technological products. Reluctantly, she decided to clean up the room instead. As she moved the sofa to sweep the floor, she discovered a hidden compartment underneath. Inside, there were various boxes, one of which was marked Energy. Out of curiosity, she opened it to find Terry's files. She learned that her daughter named Jane had been taken from her. There was also a photo with Dr. Brenner, the one she had always referred to as Father. She turned on the radio, covered her eyes, and activated her telepathy to search for Terry. Once she entered the mental space, she saw a woman sitting in a chair, repeating a phrase over and over. When the woman saw Eleven, she seemed to regain clarity for a moment, calling out the name Jane. But before Eleven could ask any questions, Terry disappeared. Eleven cried out, Mama, but received no response. Meanwhile, Dustin sneaked back home while Lucas was not paying attention. He rushed into his bedroom, prepared to have a serious conversation with the slug. But when he lifted the cloth covering the fish tank, the slug was gone, leaving only a slimy skin behind. The glass of the fish tank was shattered all over the floor, along with a trail of blood. Then, from behind the sofa, came chilling sounds of chewing. Dustin cautiously approached, only to find the slug had killed his pet cat and was excitedly feasting on the corpse. Upon noticing Dustin, the slug opened its monstrous mouth, the same as the creature they encountered last season. Thinking about the flesh vines, Hopper rushed to the pumpkin field, shovel in hand. He began to dig until nightfall when he finally confirmed his suspicions. Beneath the soil hid the flesh vines. After a few shovels, the vines scattered, revealing a hole big enough for a person to enter. Hopper, flashlight in hand, ventured inside the hole, only to discover that the flesh vines had taken over the underground, forming a vast network of tunnels. On the other hand, Mike went to visit Will and found him soaked in sweat, with his home filled with oddly shaped drawings. Upon Mike's inquiry, Will confessed that he was possessed by a demon and could not break free, but he could see the demon's real-time memories. But Mike encouraged him to look at it from a different perspective. This could be a good thing, because he could be a spy to help people stop the demon. But Will still trembled in fear. What if the demon discovered that he was spying on it? Mike grabbed his friend's hand, stating that they won't let it succeed. Hopper was still in the flesh vine tunnel, inspecting the terrain with the dim light of his flashlight. 
Apart from the murky air and the flesh vines, there were peculiar flesh tumors that emitted strange sounds. As soon as any foreign organism approached, the tumors would suddenly spray out toxic fuzz. Hopper was caught off guard and was sprayed in the face, causing him to cough uncontrollably. His vision blurred and he fainted in the tunnel. The exit was simultaneously covered up by flesh vines. The scene then shifted to Nancy and Jonathan. After obtaining the recording, they didn't go home but entered a motel. The landlady didn't bat an eye, as she was used to young men and women coming in late at night. When she asked them if they needed a single or double bed, they both simultaneously said, double bed. They sat up in bed with the light on, awkwardly trying to make conversation. The next day, Hopper woke up in the tunnel, coughed up some poisonous blood, and quickly began to look for an exit. However, the way ahead was blocked by flesh vines. He had to tear off a piece of his clothing to cover his mouth and nose to prevent inhaling more fuzz. Then he started looking for other exits. The tunnel was intricate with numerous forks, and he had to use cigarettes as trail markers while trying to contact the outside world via his radio, but to no avail. Suddenly, he heard a strange noise under his feet, as if he had stepped on something. When he shone his flashlight around, he saw a narrow tunnel littered with bones and a freshly dead animal. Flesh vines were happily feasting on the corpse. Seeing that an animal's body could be dragged in here suggested there must have been an exit recently. So he broke off an animal bone, wrapped his clothing around it to make a torch, and burned the vines. As the heat drove the flesh vines away, dirt was revealed beneath. Hopper began to dig with his hands, but he couldn't make a way through. Exhausted, he sat down to rest. Seizing the opportunity, the flesh vines wrapped around his legs and climbed up his shoulders, knocking him down. He didn't even have time to pick up the knife that fell to the ground. He was quickly engulfed by the vines. In the morning, Dustin's mother was frantically looking for their cat. Dustin lied, suggesting that the cat had possibly gone out for a stroll and lost its way. Pretending to call an agency, he claimed that someone had spotted the cat in another area and asked his mother to help find it. Once she had left, he immediately unlocked the cellar outside, donned a helmet and protective clothing, and laid out lunch meat on the ground. Opening the bedroom door, he called for the slug to come out and eat. Before the slug could appear, Dustin hid in the outdoor warehouse. Shortly after, the slug indeed came out, following the trail of lunch meat to the cellar entrance. However, it also spotted Dustin hiding and approached the warehouse. The frightened Dustin made a decisive dash out of the warehouse, striking the slug with a stick and knocking it into the cellar. He quickly locked the cellar and buried the household cat, cleaned up the bloodstains in the bedroom, and tried to contact Mike and Lucas via walkie-talkie. However, neither responded. Instead, Lucas's sister, annoyed by Dustin, turned off the walkie-talkie. Dustin had no choice but to go look for Mike at his house, but found out Mike wasn't home. At that moment, Steve came to apologize to Nancy, who also wasn't home. Dustin then persuaded Steve to help him. Meanwhile, Eleven had left without saying goodbye and hitched a ride to Terry's house. The person who opened the door was her aunt, Terry's sister. She mistook Eleven for a vendor and shut the door before Eleven could speak. Eleven had to use her telekinetic powers to unlock the door, her nose bleeding as she looked at her aunt with determined eyes, asking to see her mom. The woman initially thought the girl was lying because the hospital had declared that there had been a miscarriage of her sister. She was somewhat skeptical of the hospital's statement, and now that she had witnessed telekinesis firsthand, she let Eleven in. However, when the long-separated mother and daughter met, Terry still sat on the chair in a daze, repeating a phrase as if she didn't recognize the daughter standing before her. Her aunt comforted Eleven, saying that although Terry had become senile, she had always believed that Eleven would return home and had prepared a room for her. She then led Eleven to see the cozy room. This was the room Eleven had dreamed of, but she hadn't expected that her mother would be seriously ill. At this moment, the hallway lights started to flicker, guiding Eleven to Terry's door. She immediately understood that her mother was trying to communicate with her through her own superpowers. So her aunt prepared a blindfold for Eleven, and the TV switched to a no-signal channel. As Eleven entered the realm of consciousness, Terry still repeated that phrase. This time, when Eleven approached her, she finally saw the message her mother wanted to convey. Back when Terry was pregnant, she had a massive hemorrhage. Through a cesarean section, she gave birth to Eleven, and the doctor performing the surgery was Dr. Brenner. In her hazy consciousness, she clearly heard the cries of a baby, but when she woke up, the hospital told her she had had a miscarriage. Terry believed that Dr. Brenner had taken her daughter away, so she sued him, but the case fell through. She was desperate, so she took a gun to the lab, intending to take her daughter back. 
She was just one step away from success when she opened the door to her daughter's room and saw her daughter and a girl. But just as she was about to take them away, a group of guards dragged her away. Under the pretext that she had mental problems, they administered electroshock treatment. Since then, Terry became a senile patient, constantly repeating one phrase. Meanwhile, Nancy and Jonathan set off early in the morning to a distant place arriving in front of a warehouse. They rang the bell of the old iron gate. After the homeowner confirmed their identities, the gate was opened from the inside. The person who appeared was surprisingly the reporter who had been investigating the mysterious death of Nancy's friend, believing she had been persecuted by Soviet spies. Nancy knew that she and Jonathan alone couldn't take down the lab, so she contacted the reporter. He was a capable man who had found hundreds of clues and many key people. But at a glance on the wall, Nancy spotted a fatal mistake. The reporter had mixed up the timeline and Eleven's identity. So she explained the situation and played Dr. Sam's recording. However, after learning the truth, the reporter was a bit lost. The tale of the upside-down world was too bizarre and would be difficult for the public to believe. Even with the recording, it would not impact the lab. He listened to music, sipping vodka, and suddenly thought of a solution. Since the public would not accept the original story, why not embellish it to make it more plausible? For instance, Nancy's friend died as a result of toxic gas leaking from the lab. This would cause public panic and would make the media scramble to report, forcing the government to shut down the lab under pressure. During breakfast at home, Lucas asked his father how to appease mom when she's angry. His father told him to first apologize, then give whatever she wants. Lucas had an epiphany. He was quite bothered by his argument with Max and quickly made an excuse to leave in an attempt to mend their friendship. So he waited for her at the arcade, asking the owner for a private room to have a quiet talk. Lucas was sincere and even warned that knowing the truth would be dangerous, which piqued her interest. Max decided to give him a chance, but the truth sounded too outrageous. Max thought Lucas was making up stories. Therefore, she became even angrier. This time, Lucas didn't argue with her, but solemnly stated that friends don't lie. This made Max think that Lucas might be telling the truth, but she asked him for evidence, which left Lucas stumped. Will sensed danger for Hopper on this end and rushed to draw the environment he was in. Joyce took the smaller drawings and compared them with a larger map, quickly locating his position. These drawings weren't a town map, but rather the tunnel routes. They needed to figure out their specific location. Just as Joyce was at her wit's end, Bob showed up to deliver toys to Will. When Bob entered the room, he was a bit stunned. The walls were covered with Will's drawings, which looked incredibly abstract. Joyce didn't allow him to question much, and even pointed to a fork in the road in one of the drawings, asking him where it was. Bob thought it wasn't appropriate to discuss this in front of the child, and pulled Joyce into a room for a private conversation. There, he noticed the heart-shaped pattern on the window, which was identical to the shape of Lover's Lake in Hawkinstown. Suddenly, he had a breakthrough. The path composed of these drawings had a rule, avoiding water wherever possible. Bob then thought of a way to save the day. He had Joyce measure the distance between the lakes and calculate the ratio to the town map, quickly determining Hopper's approximate location. They immediately set off to the rescue. At the same time, the lab had some results from soil tests. The soil showed no trace of contamination or any toxic substances. However, when one portion of the soil was heated, it began to float and rotate in the bottle. Interestingly, the soil in the other unheated bottles exhibited the same phenomenon. Meanwhile, guided by Will, Bob found Hopper's car near a large pit. The center of the pit was filled with writhing flesh vines. Joyce quickly cut off the vines blocking the entrance to the pit, and then she and Bob entered the tunnel. They soon found Hopper's discarded cigarette on the ground. Following this clue, they found Hopper bound by the vines and cut him free. By the time the lab staff arrived, fully armed with high-temperature spray guns, Hopper, Joyce, and Bob had exited the cave. The staff began their burning operation. However, as the vines were incinerated, Will outside felt as if he was being consumed by intense flames, rolling on the ground in agony and screaming in a chicken voice. Meanwhile, the researchers went to Joyce's house to photograph the path of the vines, took away relevant materials concerning Mind Flayer, and tried to get Joyce to help fill in the details. Joyce was only filled with anger now. She had handed her child over to them for treatment, but did not receive effective treatment for a year. Now that her child's condition was worsening, she was considering transferring him to a larger hospital. Sam disagreed, but he and his researchers couldn't figure out what was wrong with Will. Meanwhile, Dustin escorted Steve home, pulling out a spiked baseball bat, and asked him to check on the slug's condition in the basement. 
However, when Steve went downstairs, the slug was nowhere to be found. All that was left was a layer of skin, recently shed, still sticky with some slime. The underground wall was destroyed, and a bottomless cave led deep into the forest. After its second molting, the slug had returned to its pack. At the same time, Nancy began her own plan. They copied the contents of the recording, then put the tape and a whistle-blowing letter into an envelope, mailing this explosive information to various newspapers. Now, all they had to do was wait for the journalists to arrive. The lab would be forced to close under public scrutiny. The reporter reminded the duo not to hide their feelings. He even invited them to stay over at his warehouse. Nancy and Jonathan denied being in love, but they still accepted the invitation. At night, although staying in separate rooms, both tossed and turned, unable to sleep. They tried to justify their actions, even going to each other to advise not to overthink. Jonathan was the first to face his feelings, impulsively kissing Nancy. Nancy no longer resisted. They finally got together, leaving the third wheel, Steve, crying in heartbreak. The next day, Lucas learnt from his sister that Dustin had tried to contact him, even leaving an alert message. He hurriedly radioed back. Dustin didn't get angry about Lucas's absence the previous night, but mentioned the slug's mutation. It had now grown into a faceless creature. In order to capture the slug, Dustin planned to spread meat along the way with Steve, setting the trap at the old dump. Lucas also wanted to help. He remembered Max saying he didn't have any evidence, so this was a perfect opportunity to show her. Thus, he first went to find Max. Her hot-tempered brother Billy was working out and too busy to answer the door. Max took this opportunity to talk to Lucas. However, to avoid arousing Billy's attention, she claimed there was a passerby spreading the gospel. Then she climbed out of the window to go with Lucas. At this time, Dustin and Steve were baiting with meat along the road. They talked about how to win over girls' hearts, but during their chat, both didn't notice that they had entered the range of the vines. By the time they reached their destination, Lucas and Max had been waiting for a while. Seeing Max, Dustin felt a bit deflated. He hadn't expected that after all his effort, Lucas would be the one to win the favor of the girl he liked. Yet there was no resentment between them. Instead, they joined forces to set up a trap, sealing the entrance of an old bus with sheet metal to serve as their hiding place. They placed a lot of raw meat on the ground, then poured gasoline starting from the meat all the way up to the entrance of the abandoned bus. After all this, they just had to wait for nightfall. On the lab side, Dr. Sam was seeing things spiral out of control and decided not to keep anything from Hopper and the others. Once Hopper had recovered, Sam took him into the affected area. The air inside was incredibly murky. The walls were more cracked, and there was a deep pit in the ground that required an elevator to descend. However, the area below wasn't the research base of the lab, but a giant nest built by the vines from the upside down. All organisms established defense mechanisms to deal with attacks. When the vines first entered the real world through the portal, they might have struggled to adapt, only occupying one wall. But over a year, they adapted to the environment and found a way to survive. The vines extended in all directions underground, forming bottomless tunnels. If they were just to burn them, it would trigger a chain reaction, and the spread of the vines would be even faster than now. Therefore, Sam hadn't found a way to completely eradicate them even up to this day. Joyce was unaware of the gravity of the situation and was apologizing to Bob, who had been pulled into this mess. Bob kept his cool and even comforted Joyce. At that moment, Will woke up from his unconscious state. Looking at Bob, he asked who he was. It seemed that he had lost his memory. Sam did a preliminary examination on him and found no abnormalities. However, Will only remembered his name, even forgetting he had saved Hopper the previous night. His next words were puzzling. He mentioned that soldiers had hurt him the previous night and that they had angered it. None of those present questioned this, but Sam had a hunch. He asked a subordinate to bring a piece of the flesh vine, then used a torch to burn it. As the flame got closer to it, Will began to feel unbearable pain. This led Sam to believe that Will was infected with a virus from the vine, which could cause neurological disorders in the host, and these viruses had a collective consciousness and could closely connect with the host's cells. Although the situation sounded severe, Sam assured Joyce that the virus could be eradicated and that researchers were conducting experiments. Once completed, Will would be safe. However, the reality was far more serious than what Sam had described. On the surface, Will seemed normal, but after the sudden burning the previous day, there had been changes in his hippocampus. If the burning continued, Will would meet a certain death. But if they didn't try to stop it, the speed of the vine's extension would be much faster than it is now, and the affected area would be far more than just the town. The virus in Will's body was spreading rapidly, and he would die sooner or later. 
Despite this, Sam didn't issue any orders after hearing the report, indicating he needed to think more about it. Hopper managed to send a Morse code message to the cabin, trying to explain to Eleven why he didn't come back to fix the TV the previous night. But there was no answer from the cabin, as Eleven was not there. Hopper thought she was still angry, so he left a voice message, promising he would return as soon as possible. Will was still trapped in the fear of the previous night. When he finally came to his senses, he told Mike that he knew how to kill the Demogorgon. He then asked the researchers to map out the path of the vines. After some contemplation, Will pointed to a photo where the vines intersected, claiming that it didn't want him to see this, undoubtedly indicating that this place was important. Without any doubt, Dr. Sam ordered his men to arm themselves and head to the location Will had pointed out. At this time, Nancy and Jonathan returned to the town, and the scene at home shocked them. They had only been gone for a day, yet the place was a mess, looking like a landfill. Joyce and Will were missing, and there was a piece of a strange Polaroid component on the floor, suggesting someone had been there. They suspected their family had been taken away by the lab and hurried over to look for them. Late into the night, Lucas was perched on top of the bus, observing the situation through a pair of binoculars. Max still insisted that the monster didn't exist. As a result, Dustin made fun of her until she reluctantly went up to talk to Lucas. Suddenly, the sound of a beast's roar echoed from the forest. A monster was seen wandering in the distance, hesitating to approach the pile of meat. Steve guessed that the meat was not plentiful enough, so he handed a lighter to Dustin, took a baseball bat, and got off the bus to lure the monster closer. Just as Steve was luring the monster, more of them suddenly appeared from all around. They surrounded Steve and then charged at him. In a thrilling moment, Steve jumped onto the bus as Dustin called for Mike's help. They had assumed the bus would provide some protection, but they forgot about the open vent at the top. A monster was poking its head in. Just as it was about to crawl into the bus, it seemed to receive some sort of signal and quickly withdrew from the garbage dump with its companions. Meanwhile, the lab's team arrived at the intersection of the vines. The ground was littered with bones. Hopper looked around and found it eerily familiar. He remembered visiting this place, which was just a graveyard for bones. Back in the hospital room, Will was crying and apologizing that it made him do it. Joyce was confused, but Mike realized that the Mind Flayer had used Will. The location he pointed out was a trap, so Mike rushed to the command room, shouting that it was a trap, but it was too late. From deep within the tunnel came the continuous roar of monsters. The air became more murky. The people in the graveyard couldn't see the direction or the enemy, and they were easily wiped out by the invading monsters. These monsters continued running towards the affected area, and nimbly climbed onto the ground. It seemed that the Mind Flayer was planning to massacre the people in the lab. Now the scene shifts to a few days ago, when Eleven learned the truth about her abduction. Her mother Terry shared to her about a girl tattooed with 008, whom Terry hoped Eleven could reunite with because they were playmates and raised together by the lab during their childhood. The girl is named Kaylee and also has superpowers. Unaware of this clue, Eleven discussed her mother's thoughts with her aunt. Luckily, they still had Terry's investigation files on missing children at home. After browsing the files, Eleven saw Kaylee's photo and used her superpowers to locate Kaylee's current residence. She wanted to inform her aunt, but found her contacting Hopper. Eleven had fallen out with Hopper, and if he knew she was hiding here, he would surely lock her up again. So she decided not to inform her aunt, took some money from her wallet, and set off for Illinois, where Kaylee resided. Upon arrival, the city was just beginning to light up with bustling streets full of people. Eleven was unaccustomed to such sights and was fascinated by them. She quickly located Kaylee's neighborhood, a dark place filled with homeless people living in squalor. In contrast to the bustling streets she had just seen, this area had a Gotham City vibe. Kaylee resided in an abandoned warehouse. When Eleven arrived, a group of people were chatting around a bonfire, highly alert. Knowing that Eleven was looking for Kaylee, they suspected she was a spy sent by the police. A man pulled out a knife and demanded to know how she found them. Suddenly, a spider appeared on his hand, frightening him into dropping his knife. However, no one else saw the spider. It turned out that Kaylee had used her superpower to create illusions. Recognizing the tattoo on Eleven's wrist, Kaylee remembered the girl who used to live with her in the rainbow room at Hawkins' lab. They recognized each other, and although they weren't related by blood, they were as close as sisters. That night, they sat on the warehouse rooftop, chatting. Kaylee conjured beautiful butterflies, which left Eleven awestruck. Over the past year, she had been forced to separate from Mike and hide in a cabin with no one to share her grievances. Kaylee made her feel warmth and trust at that moment. 
However, she also understood Hopper's good intentions. As she fell asleep, she returned to the cabin in her consciousness, hearing Hopper's hurried voicemail apologizing for breaking his promise to return home on time due to an emergency in the town. Just then, a hand landed on Eleven's shoulder. She woke with a start to find Kaylee sitting by her bed, introducing her to her friends, the group she was leading. These individuals, ordinary people without superpowers, had been rejected by society for various reasons, such as running away from domestic violence and found a home with Kaylee. They followed Kaylee to take revenge on the scum who had hurt them in the past, acting as vigilantes. However, they were amateurs, always discovered by the police, now hiding in the warehouse as wanted criminals. Their operations couldn't stop, so when Kaylee learned that Eleven could locate people through photos, she wanted to recruit her to help find those who had perpetrated many evils. In this way, they could take revenge without alerting the police. Eleven, who had been used as an experiment since childhood, understood this kind of harm and without much thought agreed to join. She even claimed she had killed people too and was a fighter. In fact, she had killed more people than anyone else there. Kaylee planned to start with a preliminary operation to test the effectiveness. However, before the action began, she wanted to tap into Eleven's potential and train her to control her powers. Eleven was asked to move a distant train car with her psychic abilities. But Eleven, having heard Hopper's apology the previous night, held little resentment and struggled to use her abilities. Her past experiences in flipping a car to kill a faceless monster were driven by anger and the desire to protect someone, enabling her to perform extraordinarily. Kaylee told her that although she wasn't feeling anger at the moment, she could recall the times when she was angry, learn to concentrate on that emotion, and then unleash it. Eleven quickly grasped this method. Within minutes, she managed to shift the train car, earning applause from the others. Next, they began to choose their revenge targets, settling on a man in fat who used to work at the lab and was responsible for using electric shocks to tame disobedient individuals. Eleven quickly located his residence. Kaylee then changed Eleven's image to fit the punk style of the team. Later, they went to a supermarket to stock up on supplies, but instead of paying, they simply stole what they needed. At night, when everything was quiet, Eleven used her psychic abilities to unlock the man in fat's front door. He was in his living room watching TV and was completely unaware of the intrusion. When a group of people stood in front of him, he didn't even have a chance to run his chubby body away. He said they could do some free shopping here. But then, two of the intruders removed their masks, revealing themselves as the little girls from the lab years ago. He realized that he was being confronted by his enemies. In a panic, he claimed he was just following orders, and the real villain was Dr. Brenner, who faked his death and was now in hiding. He offered to reveal the doctor's hideout if they spared his chubby and shitty life. But Eleven could locate people just by using their photos, so there was no need to believe the man's greasy words. Under Kaylee's urging, Eleven took a hard line against the man in fat. However, just as she was about to torture him to death, she saw a family photo on the floor, showing two daughters and a father. Eleven softened because of that. The two daughters, hiding in the bedroom, had already called the police. The companion urged Kaylee to leave quickly, but Kaylee didn't want to abandon her mission. So she pulled out a gun and aimed it at the man in fat, only to have it knocked out of her hand by Eleven's psychic abilities. The police cars had already arrived, and Kaylee reluctantly ordered everyone to retreat. Back at the warehouse, Eleven sat on the second floor, silent. Kaylee was disappointed in her actions but still tried to persuade her, igniting her desire for revenge and fighting against Dr. Brenner. Eleven didn't want to listen to Kaylee. However, she suddenly heard Dr. Brenner's voice behind her. Turning around, she saw the man who had tortured her for years standing at the door. She knew that the figure was an illusion created by Kaylee. She was unsure whether Dr. Brenner was alive or dead. As the illusion approached, Eleven trembled in fear and almost burst into tears. But with her strong will, she managed to banish the illusion from her mind. Seeing Eleven in pain, Kaylee felt that she had achieved her goal, so she gave Eleven time to think. Eleven closed her eyes, thinking of the boy Mike, who had once brought her the happy days in the cabin. Then she entered the mental realm and saw Hopper staring at a screen, saying that he'd been there. It's a cemetery! But Mike anxiously shouted that it's a trap. Eleven wanted to help, but the figures of Mike and Hopper disappeared. 
At this point, they heard the sound of a door being kicked open. The police had discovered their hideout. However, Kaylee used her superpowers just as the police broke in, creating an illusion that made them believe the warehouse was empty. She then bolted with the others, racing towards a van with the intention to make a quick getaway. But the police outside spotted them, and a firefight ensued. Suddenly, a high wall rose from the ground, freezing all the cops in their tracks. Naturally, this was Kaylee's doing. Seizing the moment of the police's shock, Kaylee instructed everyone to get in the car. But Eleven hesitated. She remembered Mike's earlier desperation and guessed he must be in danger. She had to go back and save him. Thus, in the moment the wall vanished, she turned and ran into a nearby alley while Kaylee and the others drove away. Soon after, Eleven got a ride back to town. Observing her youthful appearance, the stranger assumed she was a runaway child and asked if she was going back to her parents. She replied she was going to find her friends. At the lab, a monster had crawled onto the ground in the affected area. It slammed its body against the glass. Everyone who hadn't escaped watched the spectacle from behind the glass. Sam claimed the glass was high-tech and wouldn't shatter. The monster let out a howl, calling its companions, and soon, several more monsters crawled up from below. They started a frenzied attack, and cracks began to appear in the supposedly indestructible glass. Seeing that the glass would not hold the monsters back, Sam quickly hit the red alarm. Everyone evacuated urgently. The researchers ran towards the elevator, frantically pressing the button, but the elevator doors took time to close. Before they could, the monsters had shattered the glass and rushed in. None inside survived. Sam and Hopper managed to escape into a nearby exit and climbed up the stairway to leave. Meanwhile, Mike knew that Will was under the influence of the Mind Flayer and guessed it would lock onto his location in the hospital room, so he took out an injection to force him to sleep. Fearful, Will kept denying the need for it. Joyce was confused about what was happening, but seeing her son so frantic and hearing gunshots outside, she felt something was wrong. So she let Bob hold the child while she injected him, causing Will to instantly quiet and down. Just then, Sam and Hopper arrived, quickly picked up Will and prepared to escape. But the corridor was filled with monsters. There was no clear path to leave. They had no choice but to find a room and hide for the time being. They happened to enter the surveillance room and saw the hellish scene in the lab. Besides them, there were no other survivors in the entire building. Suddenly, the building lost power and plunged into darkness. On the other side of town, Max's parents returned home from an outing. As soon as they entered the house, they wanted to check on their daughter, but they couldn't find her. They turned to Billy, but he had no idea where his stepsister was. His father ordered him to cancel his date and go out in the middle of the night to look for her. Meanwhile, Max was wandering outside. She had run away from home, initially planning to see proof of the Upside Down with Lucas. This led her to join the plan to capture the slug, an identifiable creature with a tattoo on its bottom. Their plan went smoothly at first, but they were nearly killed by monsters. Unexpectedly, they ran into the Mind Flayer attacking the lab. They narrowly escaped and were now walking along the railway track to get back. Halfway through, Steve heard a monster's roar in the distance. He ran towards the sound and saw the pitch-black lab, guessing that the sound came from there. At the same time, Jonathan and Nancy also arrived at the entrance of the lab. They wondered if the lab had closed for the day since even the security booth was deserted. Nancy then noticed some disturbance in the forest, so she cautiously approached and found it was Steve and the others. Inside the lab, Dr. Sam and Hopper were discussing how they could escape. They had plotted a route, but the lab building had protective measures which would seal the entire building if the power went out. Even if they made it to the exit, they wouldn't be able to leave without restoring the power, going to the basement to switch on the circuit breaker and resetting the door lock mode on the computer. Hopper originally thought of going to the basement himself, but would be useless because the computer was complex for him to operate. Sam didn't understand programming languages, so the responsibility fell on Honest Bob. Armed with a walkie-talkie and a handgun, Bob ventured into the third basement floor alone. There was no danger along the way. All the basement staff were dead. It seemed the monster had swept through here not long ago and wouldn't return for the time being. Bob switched on all the circuit breakers, and the lab was bathed in light. The surveillance system in the control room also started working again. Under Sam's guidance, Bob found the computer and managed to unlock all the doors with some quick operations. Just then, a monster headed towards the basement. Bob cleverly turned on the fire hose, scaring the monster away. 
However, as he turned to leave, he forgot the gun on the table. Over there, Hopper had already arrived at the exit with his team. Sam chose to stay in the surveillance room to give directions, ready to deal with any sudden appearance of monsters. Bob sprinted all the way back to the first floor. Before he could run towards the exit, Sam told him that a monster was around the corner. He advised Bob to hide in a nearby storage room. Frightened, Bob held his breath. As expected, the monster soon left without finding its target. Bob stepped out of the storage room, but didn't expect to knock over a mop as he did so. The sound of the stick hitting the ground was unusually clear. The departing monster turned and charged towards him. Bob broke into a run. He finally escaped to the lobby on the first floor where he surprisingly stopped to catch his breath and locked eyes with Joyce, who was waiting for him at the door. Just then, the monster broke through the lobby door. Bob was immediately knocked down. Hopper wanted to save him, but his fists and muscles were no match for the four-headed monster. As Bob was killed to meet Jesus, Hopper could only drag Joyce away, meet up with the others outside, and quickly drive away from the lab. They rushed to Joyce's house, an immediate hideout. They then called the authorities for help. When asked why they didn't call the police, Hopper could only explain that he was the police. The authorities didn't believe them, told Hopper to wait, and hung up after a few perfunctory sentences. None of the others could think of anyone else to turn to for help, so they could only sit and wait. In the meantime, they couldn't avoid feeling heartbroken over Bob's tragic death. They all felt that his sacrifice shouldn't be in vain. The kids came up with a good solution. Although there were many monsters outside, they were all under some form of control. The real boss was the virus inside Will, which connected to the Upside Down through the flesh-like vines, forming a hive mind that controlled the actions of the monsters and the vines. This was the collective consciousness that Sam had mentioned earlier. This virus corresponded to an ancient monster, the Mind Flayer, who believed it was the master of all things and that other species were inferior. It could use its powerful psychic abilities to control the brains of creatures, thereby ruling the worlds of other creatures. So, to solve this crisis, they must kill the Mind Flayer. They guessed that only Will, who now shares a body with the Mind Flayer, would know how to kill the Mind Flayer. In order to converse with Will while dodging the Mind Flayer's surveillance and avoiding giving their location away to the monster, the group repurposed a warehouse. They covered its walls with cloth and planks, then tied an unconscious Will to a chair and shone high beam lights on him. Once the warehouse no longer resembled a storage space but looked more like an interrogation room, Hopper woke Will up. Upon awakening, Will didn't recognize his own mother and yelled for his release. When he tired from his chicken screaming, Joyce sat down on a chair opposite him and began recounting old stories, hoping familiar narratives would bring back his consciousness. As Will's demeanor softened, Mike and Jonathan joined in the storytelling. Listening to his mother's calls, Will felt a strong urge to cry, but when he opened his mouth, he told them to let him go. Hopper noticed Will's fingers continuously tapping the leg of the chair. He was already communicating, but in Morse code. To stimulate Will into further communication, Jonathan played his favorite rock music. The others took turns telling him stories as Nancy and Dustin helped translate, but they only got one word close. As the group was left in confusion, the home phone suddenly rang. Even though Nancy smashed the phone, the Mind Flayer had already used it to locate their hiding spot and relayed this information to the other monsters through the flesh-like vines. Joyce had no choice but to sedate Will and hide with the others inside the house, arming themselves with their meager weapons for an impending battle. Soon they heard the monsters outside, but they didn't break into the house immediately and instead shrieked outside. Suddenly, a monster broke through the window, but upon a closer look, they found it was already dead. The front door lock automatically unlocked. The group, terrified, quickly aimed their guns at the entrance. However, it wasn't a monster who walked in, but Eleven, who had returned just in time with her cool punk style and nose bleeding. Mike, seeing the girl he had been longing for day and night, rushed over to embrace her, unable to believe that she was real. He asked her why she didn't tell him that she was alive, but Hopper replied that he didn't let her tell. The more people know about her, the more danger would be brought. Mike understood this, but argued with Hopper anyway, venting his pent-up emotions. Eleven had no time to rest. After understanding the situation, she pointed out that what Will meant by close was actually to close the gate to the upside down in the lab, the gate that she had opened when her powers spiraled out of control. She was confident that she could now close it, but the gate was much larger than before and guarded by many monsters. It wasn't as simple as wanting to close it. Moreover, with the Mind Flayer and Will sharing a body, if it died, Will surely wouldn't survive either. 
unless they could force the Mind Flayer out of Will's body. Joyce had an idea. When Will was possessed by the Mind Flayer, he avoided hot showers, suggesting that it disliked heat. With this in mind, they planned to warm up Will enough to make his body inhospitable, hoping the Mind Flayer would leave on its own. However, to avoid the Mind Flayer discovering their location, they needed a hidden spot. Hopper's cabin came in handy for this. Joyce and the two took Will to the cabin, while Hopper and Eleven went to the incident area. Once the Mind Flayer left Will's body, Eleven could use her powers to close the gate. As for those who couldn't fight, they had to stay at home and wait for news. In the evening, Eleven was silent. Hopper asked her where she had been and why she came back with a different look. His words were filled with concern. Although Eleven was impatient, she answered truthfully and expressed that she shouldn't have left. Hopper wasn't really angry, and since she apologized, he admitted his own mistakes. They forgave each other, becoming like a father-daughter duo with a bond stronger than blood. They soon arrived at the laboratory, with Eleven leading the way despite her fear of the place. Joyce and the others reached the cabin, tied Will to the bed, lit the fireplace, and positioned heaters all around the bed. Sweat poured from Will as he woke up, screaming in pain, but thinking of Bob's death, Joyce, instead of sympathizing with her son, cranked the heaters to their maximum output. Meanwhile, Billy was asking around and learned about his stepsister Max's interactions with Mike and the others. He reached Mike's house, hoping to find Max there, but Mike's parents were indifferent about their kid's whereabouts, guessing she was playing at Joyce's house. After getting Joyce's address, Billy left in a hurry. At the house, Dustin was preserving the monster's body in the refrigerator with Steve. Max and Lucas were cleaning, while Mike was pacing around the house restlessly, concerned about Eleven. Dustin suggested they lure the monster away from the lab so Eleven could easily enter the incident area without fighting the monster. The Vine Tunnel had a central junction, and if they started a fire there, it would spread in all directions. When the Mind Flayer sensed danger, it would summon monsters to attack. By the time the monsters arrived, they could escape through the hole Hopper dug last time. But when the young team had their plan ready, Steve disagreed. Hopper had asked him to take care of everyone and not let the kids take risks. Just then, they heard a sports car outside. Billy had arrived. Steve tried to get rid of him by saying Max wasn't there, but Max peeked out the window and was caught by Billy. He brazenly entered the house, saw Lucas, who often talked to his sister, and immediately gave him a hard time. Before he could start a fight, Steve rushed in. The two disliked each other and soon fists were flying, but Steve was overpowered by Billy and couldn't retaliate. Seeing that things were about to get out of hand, Max grabbed the syringe and jabbed it into Billy's neck. Billy didn't pass out immediately but fell to the floor laughing. Max, now brave for her friends, threatened him with a nail-studded bat, saying he wasn't allowed to bully her friends anymore. She then swung the bat at his groin, scaring Billy into agreeing. After dealing with Billy, everyone quickly left with a lot of gasoline. Steve, beaten barely conscious, was taken along in a mad dash to the pumpkin field. The five of them found the cave, put on goggles, and equipped themselves with gasoline and flashlights, heading towards the junction based on their map. There was no security and the vines were still. Seeing this, they doused the area in gasoline, with Lucas even using a spray to evenly distribute it. Inside the cabin, Will's pain was escalating as his body rigidly arched in place. Jonathan thought his brother was going to be roasted alive and tried to persuade his mother to stop the heating. Even though it pained her to watch, Joyce didn't stop. Soon, dark marks appeared on Will's body. Unable to bear it any longer, the Mind Flayer forcefully broke the ropes binding Will's hands and feet. Joyce hurried to stop him but was choked. The strength in his hand was too much for her to pry open. Upon entering the lab, Hopper and Eleven chose to go to the incident area via the stairs instead of taking the elevator. On their way, they ran into the gravelly injured Sam. They administered first aid and left him with a handgun for protection before continuing their journey to the underground. There were still monsters patrolling the area, so it seemed they had a fierce fight ahead. At that moment, the young team finished pouring gasoline. Steve threw out a lighter and the fire spread throughout the space. Then they ran with the kids towards the exit. Back at the cabin, Nancy prodded Will's body with a pair of fire tongs. The pain made him release his grip and intense pain swept over him. The vines struggled in the fire and Will was in so much pain he wished for death. Unable to bear the heat any longer, the Mind Flayer abruptly fled Will's body. Hopper had just encountered the monsters and hadn't fired his gun yet when the monsters ran towards the underground. Jonathan, seeing Will was out of danger, radioed Hopper to start the gate-closing operation. Without the monsters hindering them, Hopper and Eleven successfully entered the underground. 
Facing the gigantic door, Eleven began to exert her powers, just as the Mind Flayer hurried back. On the other side, a monster caught up with Steve and the others. It had a tattoo on its buttocks. Dustin recognized the monster as the Slug Pet. He believed the Slug still recognized him, so he communicated with it and presented a candy from their shared past. The Slug had loved this candy when it was younger. As expected, the Slug calmed down as soon as it had the candy. Dustin quickly asked the others to leave, but as they found the hole and tried to climb out, more monsters arrived. But the monsters didn't bother with them, and instead all rushed towards the gate to the Upside Down. At that moment, under Eleven's power, the gate was showing signs of closing. Although the monsters tried to disrupt her, Hopper was there, shooting any that came close. To maximize her power, Eleven did as Kaylee taught. She remembered things that made her angry and let that anger out. Just as the Mind Flayer extended its tentacles, planning to finish Eleven itself, Eleven raised both hands, floating mid-air, and unleashed an unprecedented amount of power. The town's lights were as bright as day due to this force, and the Mind Flayer, underpowered against Eleven, retreated into the Upside Down. The gate to the Upside Down then closed, and all the monsters fell into the deep pit. The slug, who was enjoying his candy, also gradually died. In the end, the Mind Flayer was finally sealed, and the town returned to its usual tranquility. One month later, the reporter's whistleblower letter and tapes were exposed, causing the lab to become the focus of public scrutiny. Under pressure, the government shut down the lab and issued an apology to the parents of Nancy's deceased friend. One day, Hopper met with Dr. Sam at a restaurant. Sam, in fact, turned out to be a kind-hearted man. Upon learning about Eleven's experiences, he didn't wish to exploit her abilities, but instead helped her acquire a birth certificate through his connections, making Hopper her official guardian. He could now look after Eleven openly and legitimately. Soon after, the school hosted the annual Snowball Dance, an event eagerly anticipated by all. The boys' team naturally attended. Will asked his mom to teach him how to dance. Lucas rehearsed his dance invitation lines in front of a mirror, while Dustin, following Steve's tips, styled his hair to impress and win the girls over. However, things didn't go as Dustin had planned. Lucas ended up pairing with Max, and Will was invited by a girl. Dustin, however, was left on his own, and his attempts to ask a girl to dance were rejected. Seeing Dustin alone, Nancy approached him and offered to be his dance partner, hence making his night worthwhile. Meanwhile, Mike was joined by his dream girl, Eleven, dressed in a stylish long dress, her hair done up and makeup applied. To Mike, she looked incomparably beautiful. However, amidst the joyful dancing, the mind flayer in the Upside Down was closely watching the school like a peeping Tom, seemingly waiting for another surprise attack. And here ends season two of this drama. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.